Well, welcome again to another podcast, Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. I'm your host, Irv Risch. And as we move forward, we're going to be going through the entire New Testament. Uh, and with that, we're going to do a commentary afterwards. And uh, with that said, let us just move on to our next section. And thank you for joining me. Chapter 21 And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera, and having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem, and some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them, and went into the temple giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled, and the offering presented for each one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place." for they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. 
Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian, then, who recently stirred up a revolt and led the four thousand men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Acts chapter 21 21 verses 1 to 4a, after the tender and affectionate farewell at Miletus, Paul and his companions sailed to the island of Cos, where they spent the night. The following day they continued southeast to the island of Rhodes. Leaving the northern tip of the island, they sailed eastward to Patera, a seaport of Lycia on the southern coast of Asia Minor. At Patera they transferred to a ship that was sailing over to Phoenicia, the coastal strip of Syria, of which Tyre was one of the principal cities. As they sailed southeast across the Mediterranean, they skirted south of the island of Cyprus, leaving it on the left hand. The first port of call on the mainland of Palestine was Tyre. Since the ship was to unload her cargo there, Paul and the others looked up the Christian believers and stayed with them seven days. 21 verse 4b, it was during this time that these disciples told Paul through the Spirit that he should not set foot in Jerusalem. This raises the age-old question as to whether Paul was deliberately disobedient in going to Jerusalem, whether he unwittingly failed to discern the mind of the Lord, or whether he was actually in the will of God in going. A casual reading of verse 4b might seem to indicate that the apostle was willful and headstrong, acting in deliberate defiance of the Spirit. However, a more careful reading might indicate that Paul did not actually know that these warnings were given through the Spirit. Luke, the historian, tells his readers that the advice of the Tyrian disciples was Spirit-inspired, but he does not say that the Apostle knew this as a definite fact. It seems far more probable that Paul interpreted the advice of his friends as calculated to save him from physical suffering or even death. In his love for his Jewish countrymen, he did not feel that his physical well-being was the important consideration. 21 verses 5, 6, When the seven days had expired, the believers of Tyre turned out en masse to accompany the missionaries to the beach in an eloquent demonstration of their Christian love. After a time of prayer and affectionate goodbyes, the ship pulled out and those left on shore returned home. 21 verse 7, the next stop was Ptolemae, pronounced Ptolemaeus, a seaport approximately 25 miles south of Tyre, and now known as Akko, Acre, near Haifa. It was named after Ptolemy. A stopover of one day permitted the Lord's servants to visit the local brethren. 21 verse 8, on the next day they took the final portion of their voyage a 30-mile sail south to Caesarea, on the plain of Sharon. There they stayed in the house of Philip the Evangelist, not to be confused with the apostle by that name. It was this Philip who was chosen to be a deacon by the church in Jerusalem and who carried the gospel to Samaria. Through his instruction, the Ethiopian eunuch had been saved. 21 verse 9, Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. This means they were gifted by the Holy Spirit to receive messages directly from the Lord and to convey them to others. Some have inferred from this verse that it is permissible for women to preach and teach in the church. However, since it is expressly forbidden for women to teach, speak, or have authority over the men in the assembly, 1 Corinthians 14 verses 34 and 35, 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 and 12, it can only be concluded that the prophetic ministry of these four virgin daughters was carried on in the home or in other non-church gatherings. 21 verses 10, 11, During Paul's stay in Caesarea, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. It was the same prophet who came to Antioch from Jerusalem and predicted the famine which took place during the reign of Claudius, Acts 11 verse 28. 
Now he took Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet with it. By this dramatic action, like many of the prophets before him, he was acting out his message. Then he gave the meaning of the object lesson. Just as he had bound himself, hands and feet, so would the Jews of Jerusalem bind the hands and feet of Paul and deliver him over to the Gentile authorities. Paul's service for the Jews, symbolized by the belt, would result in his being captured by them. 21 verses 12 to 14, when the apostles' companions and the Christians in Caesarea heard this, they pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. But he could not sympathize with their concern. Their tears only served to break his heart. Should the fear of chains and imprisonment restrain him from doing what he considered to be God's will? He would have them know that he was ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. All their arguments proved of no value. He was determined to go, and so they simply said, The will of the Lord be done. It is difficult to believe that Paul's parting words were spoken by a man who was knowingly disobeying the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We know that the disciples in Tyre told him through the Spirit that he should not go to Jerusalem, ve 4. But did Paul know they spoke through the Spirit? And did not the Lord later seem to approve his trip to Jerusalem when he said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome, 23 verse 11? Two things are clear. First, Paul did not think his personal safety was the main consideration in serving the Lord. Second, the Lord overruled all these events for his glory. 21 verses 15, 16, from Caesarea to Jerusalem was an overland journey of more than 50 miles, a long trip in those days of slow transportation. The apostles' traveling party had been increased by the addition of some of the disciples from Caesarea and also by a Christian brother named Nason, pronounced Nason. Originally from Cyprus, he had been one of the earliest disciples there. Now he was living in Jerusalem and was privileged to be host to the apostle and those who journeyed with him during Paul's last visit to Jerusalem. Paul's missionary journeys really end with his arrival in Jerusalem. The remainder of the book of Acts is occupied with his arrest, trial, journey to Rome, trial, and imprisonment there. 21 verses 17, 18, Upon arrival in Jerusalem, the apostle and his friends were cordially received by the brethren. The next day a meeting was arranged with James and all the elders. There is no way of knowing for sure which James is referred to here. It could be James, the brother of our Lord, James, the son of Alphaeus, or some other person with that name. The first is the most likely. 21 verses 19, 20 a, Paul took the lead by telling in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. This caused considerable rejoicing. 21 verses 20 b to 22, however, the Jewish brethren were apprehensive. Word had traveled around that the Apostle Paul had preached and taught against Moses and the law. This could mean trouble in Jerusalem. The specific charge being made against Paul was that he taught all the Jews in foreign lands to forsake Moses by telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the Jewish customs. Did Paul actually teach this or did he not? He did teach that Christ was the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe. He did teach that once the Christian faith had come, believing Jews were no longer under the law. He taught that if a man received circumcision as a means of obtaining justification, then such a man cut himself off from salvation in Christ Jesus. He taught that to return to the types and shadows of the law, after Christ had come, was dishonoring to Christ. In view of this, it is not hard to see why the Jews should think of him as they did. 21 verses 23, 24, But the Jewish brethren in Jerusalem had a scheme which they thought would placate their countrymen, both saved and unsaved. They suggested that Paul should take upon himself a Jewish vow. For men were already in the process of doing this. Paul should join them, purify himself with them, and pay their expenses. F. W. Grant explains. Let him take these four men, who being believers like himself could yet bind themselves with the Nazarite vow, and presenting himself with them in the temple purified, take upon him the expenses necessary for the completion of it, and that publicly, that all might recognize clearly his own relation to the law. We do not know much about what this vow involved. The details are veiled in obscurity. But all we need to know is that it was a Jewish vow, 
and that if the Jews saw the apostle going through the ritual connected with it, they would know assuredly that he was not turning others away from the law of Moses. It would be an indication to the Jews that the apostle himself kept the law. The action of the apostle in taking on himself this Jewish vow has been defended and criticized. In defense of Paul it has been argued that he was acting according to his own principle to be all things to all men, if by any means he might save some, 1 Corinthians 9 verses 19 to 23. On the other hand, Paul has been criticized for going too far in an effort to conciliate the Jews, and thus creating the impression that he was under the law. In other words, Paul has been charged with being inconsistent with his view that the believer is not under the law either for justification or as a rule of life, Galatians 1 and 2. We tend to agree with this criticism, but we also feel that one should be careful in judging the apostles' motives. 21 verse 25, the Jerusalem brethren advised Paul that no rules need be imposed on Gentile believers other than those proposed by the council in Jerusalem, namely, the Gentiles, should abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. 21 verse 26, the steps taken by Paul are not clear to us today. Many commentators think this was the Nazarite vow. But even if this were the case, we still do not understand the various steps in the ceremony as described in this section. H. Paul's Arrest and Trials, 21 verse 27 to 26 verse 32. 21 verses 27 to 29, when the seven days of the vow were almost ended, Paul's attempt to pacify the Jews proved futile. When some of the unbelieving Jews from proconsular Asia saw him in the temple, they incited a riot against him. Not only did they charge him with teachings that were contrary to the Jewish people and to the law, but they also accused him of defiling the temple by taking Gentiles into the inner courts. What actually happened was this, they had previously seen Paul with Trophimus in the city of Jerusalem. Trophimus was a Gentile convert from Ephesus. Because they saw them together, they supposed that Paul had taken his Gentile friend into the inner courts of the temple. 21 verses 30 to 35, although the charge was obviously false, it served its purpose. All the city was thrown into an uproar. The mob seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple area, closing the gates of the inner courts behind them. As they proceeded to kill him, word reached the Chile Arch, a military commander in charge of the garrison of Antonia. He came in a hurry with some of his soldiers and took Paul from the infuriated mob, bound him with two chains, and asked who he was and what he had done. The mob was, of course, incoherent and confused. Some cried one thing and some another. The frustrated officer commanded the soldiers to bring the prisoner into the barracks so he could find out more definitely what was going on. Even in the attempt to do this, the mob surged forward with such determination that Paul had to be carried by the soldiers up the stairs. 21 verses 36, as they did so, they heard words ringing out from the multitude, words that perhaps some of them had heard before away with him. 21 verses 37 to 39, just as they were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the officer if he could say something. The officer was startled to hear Paul speaking Greek. He apparently thought he had arrested an Egyptian who had stirred up a rebellion and led 4,000 men called assassins out into the wilderness. Paul quickly assured him that he was a Jew from the city of Tarsus, in Cilicia. As such, he was a citizen of no mean city, it was famous as a place of culture, education, and commerce, and had been declared a free city by Augustus. With characteristic fearlessness, the apostle requested permission to speak to the people. 21 verse 40, permission was granted, and as Paul stood there, flanked by Roman soldiers, he quieted the crowd by motioning with his hand. The silence was as great as the tumult had been. He was now ready to give his testimony to the Jerusalem Jews. The Hebrew language here probably means Aramaic, a closely related tongue, as spoken by the Hebrews at that time. Well, this ends another one of our podcasts. And until uh, next time, just remember, God is out here. And you can find out all about him in your Bibles. All you have to do is pick it up and read it. I have mine right here. And uh, God is in this Bible. So please read it. With that said, bye for now. Till next time.